That's amazing. There are hundreds of bats. This place wasn't supposed to exist anymore. We were told the Samborondon rubbish tip had been closed. But we were here six years ago. Now we're back, investigating the big promise of the end of poverty. I get the feeling everything's got a bit bigger, more rubbish, more birds, and it stinks more than it did last time. This mountain of rubbish feeds a lot of people. In the past, they lived and worked here, even children. One child was called Eusebio. They think the rubbish has built up in recent years. Six years ago, the line was one meter lower, so we're standing a meter higher now. Where's Eusebio? Six years ago, Eusebio was 11. He too lived in the rubbish. He knew nothing about a big promise, even though it was meant for him. The world's leaders made it in 2000. Halving poverty, clean water, education for all children. Those were the Millennium Goals. They were to be achieved by now, 2015. there's still a lot going on here on the tip. Plastic bottles are particularly sought after. They're worth good money. We don't see any children anymore. Children aren't allowed to work here anymore. Maybe he's in San Borondon. Ask in the school. Where's Eusebio now? Ecuador has banned child labor in response to international pressure. But at night in the capital, Quito, we're surrounded by young vendors. Despite the ban, the police tolerate them. Back then, six years ago, we noticed a boy, Gustavo. He was only 10. He sold roses until three in the morning. He lived in the emergency shelter of the Catholic Salesian Order. Maybe he's still there. I'm on tenterhooks. Back then, Gustavo was all alone. He talked about his mother who beat him and about his stepfather who was an alcoholic. The Salesians told us he often skipped school because he was too tired. We are looking for this boy. Gustavo is his name. Yes, he's over there. He's, he's inside? Yes. Yeah. Really? Are you sure? Yes. Yes. This boy? Yeah. Yes, that's him, just bigger. Was it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a long time ago. OK, can, can we can we yeah. see him? Yeah. I think he's here. Houses like this are often the only place where street kids can stay. Without volunteers, they'd be left to their own devices. Hola. Are you this boy? Sí. Sí. Yes. Hi, hello. Nice to meet you. I'm Marcus. Are you Gustavo? Sí. Yes. Gustavo, how are you? Sí. ¿Cómo está? ¿Cómo estás, Gustavo? I'm well. Yeah. His childhood on the streets seems a distant memory. No. No? That was six years ago. I can't remember that. It was tough to work on the streets and to get up so early. It's still tough, but a lot has changed. Gustavo wants to show us later what exactly has changed. What about Eusebio from the rubbish tip? We'll continue to look for him.
The big promise, halving poverty, clean water for all, was meant for the whole world, including for Mrs. Lee in Cambodia. We met her six years ago. Back then, she had 13 children, and she had to fight for every single drop of water. We don't get anything here. My children beg for water everywhere. Sometimes people give us a few bowls, but today we've got almost nothing in our bucket. A neighbor has given us a bit. She used to live here, right at the top, on the roof of a disused cinema. The building was full of people. Nobody knows how many exactly. They still live in all sorts of corners, a slum in the middle of the capital, Phnom Penh, hidden in the shadow of the many new skyscrapers. Hello. Hello. The closed tap from back then still exists today, six years later. That's where she sat. Look, that's the same sign. So you, you live here? In this room? Yes. Alone? So, do you know her? What has happened to her? She died three years ago. Three months or three years? Three years. Three years, three years ago. Mrs. Lee is dead. The neighbor goes on to tell us that of her 13 children, eight have died as well one from dengue fever, one from tuberculosis, one was severely disabled. Suddenly, Mrs. Lee's husband shows up. He only comes here rarely, he says, since the day his family suddenly fell apart. My youngest daughter came running to me and said that her mother was dead. I couldn't believe it because she wasn't ill. When I got here, she was lying outside the house. I took her to the clinic. The doctor said she died of a brain hemorrhage when she banged her head on the ground. When she was alive, Mrs. Lee had to fight for drinking water. Now we discover water meters on the wall. They never used to be here. The crazy pipes lead to the flats on the top floor. They even have taps now, unlike six years ago. The water is clean and drinkable. The muddle works, but only for those who regularly pay for it. I just had it explained to me. The state is offering drinking water for really not much money, but private individuals are tapping into it here and selling it on. That makes water eight times as expensive for people as it otherwise would be. Mrs. Ngong can just about pay the excessive prices, unlike many here. She's a baker and earns $4 per day. She has a steady job. The whole family depends on her income. Her husband has fallen ill. His lungs can't cope anymore. We're in Mrs. Ngong's hut, 
one room, a fan, and one wooden pallet for her and her children. The five of us live in this room, but since my husband got sick, he hasn't lived here anymore. He was scared of infecting the children with his cough. We've lived here for more than 10 years. There's a toilet over there. Everyone shares it. It's very expensive to rent a house out here. Even here in the cinema on the top floor, it's expensive. I pay $20 in rent. The flats up there cost $50 to $100. How can I afford that? That's why I stay down here. The former cinema is home to 300 people. Most of them are only seen by tourists at night. Five minutes from here, on the banks of the Mekong, when they're selling balloons and friendship bracelets. They earn three to four dollars, five on a good evening. It's hot. There are bats. It's a rubbish tip. I thought it couldn't be worse than the tip in Ecuador, but this is definitely worse. The wastewater from upstairs keeps dripping from the ceiling, gradually destroying the homes of the people living below. We've lived here for more than 30 years. Those who've got a bit more money can renovate their home, but our house will soon collapse. I have to scoop up water several times a day. When we have wastewater in the house, it stinks and mosquitoes come. The water was very high. I scooped it out, otherwise you wouldn't have been able to come in. Cambodia has reported that the goal of better access to clean drinking water had been achieved and the number of poor had been halved. The UN considers anyone who has less than one and a quarter dollars a day to be poor. Here in the cinema, most people earn a bit more. That means that those who live here are officially above the poverty line. Phnom Penh is booming. Many slums have had to make way for new developments. More than half a million people have been driven from their own homes. Apartments have been built, hotels, and this shopping mall. An ice rink on the sixth floor. One hour costs $10, including skates. That's half a month's rent for Mrs. Ngong from the derelict cinema. <laughs> Cambodia is celebrating its new wealth, but only the few are benefiting. This woman wants everyone to benefit from the boom. Sitsuko Yamazaki is the voice of the Millennium Goals in Cambodia, sent by the United Nations. The government is, is, is uh, you know, working on it. They now uh, collected this year, uh, uh, increased the uh, revenue collection by 40%. You know, the economic growth is taking there. Now, we, we have to ask them to redistribute that, that wealth to public services, particularly education and health. We see oh, a lot of people. It's, it's happening, but still very, very slow. Very, very slowly in Cambodia and in many other countries. But these millennium goals were supposed to be achieved by 2015.
there are still 300,000 children in Ecuador who don't go to school. Jairo Borja, the outreach worker from the Salesian order, meets some of them regularly. We're just on our way to school. You're lying. School now? It's Friday evening. What school are you going to? You're going to year eight. You've finished year seven, right? You know we can help you. Why don't you come to us? What do you want from life? I've been with you, but I ran away. As a child, Jairo was a little vendor too. He had to earn money just like the children today. That was the only way his family could survive. It's a real problem with the children on the streets. Everyone should recognize that. Nothing's improved. If you say to a boy, you don't have to work, we'll help you and support you, then the people here protest. They want us to let the children work. He meets Gustavo on his patrols. Six years ago, he was still a child and wanted to sell us roses. Now he's 16 and dealing in cigarettes and sweets. The dangerous things here are the fights and people throwing bottles. That happens a fair bit. And when that happens, I take my things and run off. Whenever Gyro meets Gustavo's mother, he tries to appeal to her conscience every time. You have to motivate Gustavo. He needs that. His life isn't easy, and he could reach a point where he wouldn't want to continue. It's half past seven, the start of school. Gustavo's on time and wide awake. He only works weekends. <laughs> Gustavo hasn't missed a single day of school this year. He's made the advanced class, but he's always battling. The teacher's just buying cake for everyone as a reward for the good school year. His favorite subject, history, is canceled today. But his sports exam will take place in the afternoon. Sprinting, dribbling, somersaults. Oizibio, the boy from the rubbish tip. There are a few schools here he could attend. Um, Hello, we're looking for this boy. I know him. He was here for two years and then he didn't come anymore. Why? We don't know exactly. His parents were quite neglectful. They hardly looked after the child. Eusebio was registered in 2009. He attended a school for the first time when he was 11. Then he disappeared. Schooling is compulsory in Ecuador. The authorities should enforce it, though. We need more support. The government does a lot for these children, but they need to do more. As a teacher, I'm very hopeful, but it's tough. First, we have to change parents' attitudes. 
We need workshops for parents, proper classes. We're willing to do a lot. But the parents don't come. The mindset has to change. <laughs> the teacher doesn't think we'll find Eusebio in a school. The children from class 4B have overheard our conversation. They know Eusebio and his nickname, Chamba, the rubbish boy. Apparently he still lives here, just a few blocks away. Chamba. A UN conference is taking place in Ethiopia on financing for development. But first, we want to look for a farmer we've met before, six years ago. In those days, he grew teff, the grain used for Ethiopian bread. He could just about get by that way. If he still lives here, he could be at the market in Tulubolo. <laughs> No, no, we're not the police. <laughs> They're joking with us. The cloth dealer recognizes farmer Negera on the six-year-old photo. Uh, that's six, a photo from six years ago. She knows him. It's not clear how much progress the Millennium Goal fighting poverty has made in Ethiopia. The country hasn't given the UN any up-to-date figure since 2010. Back then, one in three people lived in extreme poverty. Farmer Nigera's field only measured 50 by 100 meters. The yield was just enough for him and his family. He wasn't able to sell anything. He'd papered the clay walls with an airline company's advertising photo. We know that there's a different world. One day, we want to live like that too. <laughs> Across the football pitch, the second road on the left in the third house. Or so they told us on the market. And his family? It looks like he's not there. We're going to try again after the UN conference. Okay. We had to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia's capital. It's a central hub for East Africa. The huge UN conference center lies in the heart of the city. 7,000 participants from 155 countries are flooding into this palace of big words. Ministers, civil servants, even UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is due to come. We can't see a balance sheet of the Millennium Goals anywhere on the agenda because of a lack of up-to-date figures. Many countries sent their most recent statistics to the UN, four, five, even six years ago. Spread rapidly. The German minister Gerd Müller would rather talk about the next big promise, the Sustainable Development Goals. Instead of eight, there are now 17. And they are to hold for the whole world. The target year is 2030. Another huge conference. The Millennium Goals haven't been reached yet, but the next big goals that play really well in the media are already being planned. Is that the right way? We have a paradigm shift. The world population is increasing by 80 million people every year. We now have 7.3 billion. We're approaching 10 billion. We don't have the first, second and third world anymore. We live in one world. We're in the same boat. We're all responsible for this planet. 
That's the signal of this conference. The Sustainable Development Goals will obligate Germany too, just like every other rich country. In future, social justice and climate protection will be measured too. So far, no country even in Europe has reached these new goals. The new goals, another attempt at making the world more just. We have 15 new war zones and regions ravaged by crisis this year. People are facing hopelessness. The only opportunity for them to have any prospects in life is to put themselves in the hands of people smugglers to get to Europe. But wars and crises are also caused by injustice, hunger and privation. That's why we have to start there. Our affluence in Europe, in the industrialized countries, is in part based on the exploitation of these resources and these people. The conference will end after three days. The poor and rich countries weren't able to reach an agreement. The old promise is forgotten, the new one adjourned. After the conference, we try to find Farmer Negera again. Across the football pitch, the second road on the left, third house. Hello. Is that you? <laughs> Maybe he's doing better now with the house in the city than in the small hut on his farm. I thank God that I've been allowed to see these pictures in my lifetime. That's the new house. Why does farmer Negera live in the city now and not in the countryside? A house instead of a hut. Two rooms, 25 square meters, for five people. I work as a day laborer. The money's enough from hand to mouth. I had to give up my farm. <laughs> He needed an ox for his field. It would have cost a thousand euros. A lifetime wouldn't be enough to save so much money. I was very happy on our farm. In those days, seeds and other things cost much less than they do now. It's my dream to return to our farm. I want our old life back. I want to be happy again. Farmer Negera stands on Tulo Bolo's main road every morning at half past seven. Together with 50 other people, hoping to get a job on one of the nearby building sites, at least for one day. It's a matter of luck. Sometimes I get a job, sometimes I don't. Then I have to return home without money. Ethiopia receives billions of euros every year to fight poverty. That's in development aid. And that's more than most other countries. Since our visit six years ago, the population has grown by 10 million people. That makes it harder to help. And it also makes life here tougher. <laughs> Farmer Negera would like to return to his farm. His eldest son has to work after school. Shining shoes. They earn more than one and a quarter US dollars a day. According to the UN definition, they're no longer poor. He sold hut.
The last time he was here was two years ago. I don't want my children to be farmers like me. There's a better life. They're to go to school and study. That helps them for their future. The problem is, I have to buy school uniforms, pens and books. I have to work hard for that every day. Farmer Negera believed in the big promise. This is not what he thought his life would be like. The millennium goal, education for all, also meant Eusebio. We're told he lives here. He's not allowed to work in the rubbish tip anymore. He's 16 now. Marcus. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm very happy. Thank you for coming. Do you remember us? Te acuerdas de ellos? Te acuerdas de esa foto? He can't remember, he says. But he's doing fine. Are you fine? Yes, sir. Sí. Oisebio lives in a house, not on the rubbish tip anymore. He tells us that the house belongs to his uncle, who lets them live here. I'm not on the rubbish tip anymore. I'm not working at the moment. I can't buy anything because I don't have money. I don't go to school. I don't have money for it. Eusebio's sisters are doing their homework. Their brother's bored. Two years of primary school. That's all Eusebio managed. I want to go back to the tip. I want to earn money. Six years ago, Eusebio was able to do that. Not anymore. Working on rubbish tips has been strictly prohibited for miners since 2010. To the family, this ban feels like a punishment. My memories of that time are good. He helped us and brought money home, but now he's not allowed to do that anymore. Should he work there again? Sometimes the money would be important for us. He could earn something there, but that's not possible anymore. Today, his father's having fish soup. He still works on the tip. Eusebio brings him food every day. And every day, Eusebio waits for the day he's allowed to work here again. He'll be 18 in two years' time. That's all he cares about. He doesn't have any other plans. School hasn't mattered to him for a long time. Although the millennium goal, education for all, was also meant for Eusebio. They said, if we left the tip, they'd help us with school. 
but we got nothing and the helpers never showed their faces again. Five years ago, we met... The helpers came from UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund. It fights for a worldwide ban on child labor. It's not a success in itself to just take a child out of a working situation, but then there's no... You should be taking... We should all be working to take them out of a what is an unprotected environment into a protected environment, which is school. And then also, as I say, they should have access to their wider uh, social support network, which includes uh, health. And in many cases, they, they, their families can qualify. I will promise, we, we can set that guy. There's a, there's a program we have set up specifically to catch children like him, to take them out of this. The head of UNICEF in Ecuador has kept his word. He writes to us that Eusebio has been put into a program for children who've dropped out of school. After two weeks, he left again. His mother wanted him to go to work in a supermarket. We're a few meters further in Gustavo's house, the former rose seller. That's our small living room. This is where I hang out with my brothers. This is my bedroom. My mother and father sleep here. This is where my little sisters sleep. My sister and her son sleep here. They're out at the moment. That's my bed. I sleep alone. You're the only lucky one. <laughs> That's what I work with. That's my small company. That costs one dollar. That costs 50 cents. The chocolate bars are 75 and the lollipops 25. I started selling flowers on the streets when I was five. How much is this? One dollar. That's a lot. No, it's not. At first they taught me to say 50-50. They showed me a coin so I knew which one it was. During the nights on the streets, he always admired the police officers on their motorbikes. That's when he made the decision to go to police college, in two years' time, when he's 18. He didn't have anything to play with as a child. No shoes, no coloring book. I beat him. But that's over now. I'm so happy that he's standing next to me healthy. <laughs> I'm happier now. I want to get ahead in life. I want to be the head of the family and support my mother. I want to be a good role model for my younger siblings. The promise, education for all, it's been kept for Gustavo. The heads of government didn't want to spare any efforts. They promised to put an end to hunger and poverty. Clean water was to flow and children were to go to school. Later, I'll tell the children here to go to school. I used to be one of you. It was a big promise to the poorest in the world. 
I can't make it on my own. Someone has to help me. A few of the Millennium Goals have been reached today, in 2015. It's my wish to return to my farm and work hard so I can finally afford an ox. The old promises haven't come true yet, but new ones are already being announced. How can the poor believe what the rich say? <laughs>